Well, welcome to St. Peter's Online. We're so glad that you're with us today. My name is Xavier, and whether you know Jesus or not, or whether you're just here investigating things or interested, warm welcome to you. In a moment, you will hear the Bible read and then explain. We firmly believe here at St. Peter's that God speaks to us today through His life-giving Word. And my prayer is this will help you to know Him or to know Him better. Enjoy following along. And now we have Robin and Lois who are going to give us today's readings. Good morning, everyone. The first reading is from Numbers, um, chapter 13, starting at verse 26. Report on the exploration. They came back to Moses and Aaron and the whole Israelite community of Kadesh in the desert of Paran. There they reported to them and the whole assembly and showed them the fruit of the land. They gave Moses this account. We went into the land to which you sent us and it does flow with milk and honey. Here is its fruit. But the people who live there are powerful and the cities are fortified and very large. We even saw descendants of Anak there. The Amalekites live in the Negev. The Hittites, Jezebites and Amorites live in the hill country and the Canaanites live near the sea and along the Jordan. Then Caleb silenced the people before Moses and said, We should go up and take possession of the land for we can certainly do it. But the men who had gone up with him said, We can't attack those people. They are stronger than we are. And they spread among the Israelites a bad report about the land they had explored. They said, The land we explored devours those living in it. All the people we saw there are of great size. We saw the Nephilim there, the descendants of Anak, come from the Nephilim. They seem, we seem like grasshoppers in our own eyes and we looked the same to them. That night, all the members of the community raised their voices and wept aloud. All the Israelites grumbled against Moses and Aaron and the whole assembly said to them, If only we had died in Egypt or in this wilderness... Why is the Lord bringing us to this land only to let us fall by the sword? Our wives and children will be taken as plunder. Wouldn't it be better for us to go back to Egypt? And they said to each other, We should choose a leader and go back to Egypt. Then Moses and Aaron fell face down in front of the whole Israelite assembly gathered there. Joshua, son of Nun, and Caleb, son of Jephunneh, who were among those who had explored the land, tore their clothes and said to the entire Israelite assembly, The land we pass through and explored is exceedingly good. If the Lord is pleased with us, he will lead us into that land, a land flowing with milk and honey, and will give it to us. And he do not rebel against the Lord, and do not be afraid of the people of the land, because we will devour them. Their protection is gone, but the Lord is with us. Do not be afraid of them. But the whole assembly talked about stoning them. Then the glory of the Lord appeared at the tent of meeting to all the Israelites. The Lord said to Moses, How long will these people treat me with contempt? How long will they refuse to believe in me, in spite of all the signs I have performed among them? I will strike them down with a plague and destroy them, but I will make you into a nation greater and stronger than they. Moses said to the Lord, Then the Egyptians will hear about it. By your power you brought these people up from among them and they will tell the inhabitants of this land about it. They have already heard that you, Lord, are with these people and that you, Lord, have been seen face to face. 
that your cloud stays over them and that you go before them in a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. If you put all these people to death, leaving none alive, the nations will have heard this report about you, about you will say, the Lord is not able to bring these people into the land he promised them on oath. So he slaughtered them in the wilderness. Now may the Lord's strength be displayed, just as you have declared. The Lord is slow to anger, abounding in love and forgiving sin and rebellion. Yet he does not leave the guilty unpunished. He punishes the children for the sin of the, of the far parents to the third and fourth generation. In accordance with your great love, Forgive the sin of these people, just as you have pardoned them from the time they left Egypt until now. The Lord rep replied, I have given, forgiven them as you asked. Nevertheless, as surely as I live and as surely as the glory of the Lord fills the whole earth, not one of those who saw my glory and the signs I performed in Egypt and in the wilderness but who disobeyed me and tested me ten times. Not one of them will ever see the land I promised on oath to their ancestors. No one who has treated me with contempt will ever see it. But because your servant Caleb has a different spirit and follows me wholeheartedly, I will bring him into the land. he went to, and his descendants will inherit it. Since the Amicalites and the Canaanites are living in the valleys, turn back tomorrow and set out towards the desert along the route to the Red Sea. Here ends the read, first reading. Our second New Testament reading comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verses 1 to 6. And it's titled, Warnings from Israel's History. For I do not want you to be ignorant of the fact, brothers and sisters, that our ancestors were all under the cloud and that they passed and they all passed through the sea. They were all baptised into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. They all ate the same spiritual food and drank the same spiritual drink, for they drank from the spiritual rock that accompanied them, and that rock was Christ. Nevertheless, God was not pleased with most of them, and their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. Now these things occurred as examples to keep us from setting our hearts on the evil things as they did. This too is the word of the Lord. Well, good morning, everyone. I was sorry to, uh, to miss you last week and throw Xavier in at the last minute, but it gave me an extra week to prepare. So uh, uh, there we go. The Lord is good. Uh, we're going to be having a look at that passage in Numbers chapter 13 and chapter 14, uh, which really is one of the darkest moments for the people of Israel in the Old Testament. Um, so let me pray. I'm going to ask for God's help uh, to be able to understand this passage and then put it into practice. So let me pray. Our gracious Lord, thank you uh, for speaking to us and for um, giving us your word. Please help us this morning as we come to it to understand it, to hear what it's saying, to know what it's saying, and to have that change our lives. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, well, a, a number of years ago, I went in what is called a Spartan race. Uh, it's, it's an obstacle course race uh, like this, involving mud and dirt and obstacles. Um, and the race was run over either 7, 14, or 21 kilometres, and I was running 
the 21 kilometre race out in Picton uh, in the western side of Sydney. We're about three quarters of the way through the race and the race is meant to be a challenge, uh, both mentally and physically, partly because you just never know what's coming next. Now we just scaled a very large hill um, we'd run around the top of it and we'd run all the way back down to the bottom again. And so our bodies were tired, our legs were heavy. And it's at this point, three quarters of the way through the race, that you're thinking, I think I might give up soon. And we come around a corner and brilliantly, the race organisers had set up a sandbag carry. Uh, so where you pick up a, a 20 kilogram sandbag and walk up what seemed like a vertical hill. And it's brilliant race design. Horrendous for us um, because it was so physically demanding. And I tell you what, there were exhausted bodies and dropped sandbags littering the hill. It broke people. They just couldn't keep going. And, there, and this had been, become so bad for people that there were actually no sandbags left at the bottom because they hadn't come back. People had walked up, they just dropped them and kept on going or just laying down and given up. Now, there is a saying, uh, when the going gets tough, the tough get going. But I think there's an equally true saying, which is, when the going gets tough, people quit. That's true, isn't it? When things get tough, we have a choice. Are we going to keep going or not? But, you know, some things that we do in life are tough, but they're worth doing. I'll give you some examples. Friendship is tough, but it's worth doing. Relationships are hard, but it's worth doing. Studying, that's hard, but it's worth doing. Now, for some of you, this is very true. Childbirth, it's tough, but it's worth doing. And you know what? Jesus tells uh, his followers that coming after him will be tough. It will be difficult. Absolutely worth it, yes, but challenging. And so knowing that it's going to be difficult to come after Jesus, to follow him, then the question we've got to ask is, how do we keep going when things get tough? How do we stay faithful, keep going, and not give up? And what would that look like? And that's what we're going to have a look at in Numbers chapter 13 and 14. Now, this is a momentous time for the people of Israel. Uh, just over a year ago, they'd been rescued from slavery in Egypt, 400 years of slavery in Egypt, and they've been rescued by the mighty hand of God. Now they've been brought, oh, here we go. Um, and now they've been brought right to the very border of the land that God had promised them, um, the land of Canaan. And here they are, Kadesh Barnea, just to the south of this land. And the first 10 chapters of Numbers focused on the people getting to this land, being prepared as God's people to live with him at, his, at the centre. And now they've come, taken off in chapter 10, and they've now arrived, despite a few bumps on the way, to the border of the land, the promised land. And all they need to do is go in and take it. But it all goes wrong. Now, this is a very rich passage. There's many, many things that we could say, but we're just going to focus on two things in this passage that we need to stay faithful and then a picture of what it would look like for us to remain faithful. Now, I'm not going to give you those at the start, though. We're going to reveal them as we go through. So if you've got a Bible there, grab your Bible out. We're going to have a look at the first thing that we need in order to stay faithful when things are difficult. So open up your Bibles. Have a look there. Uh, chapter 13, verse 1. The Lord said to Moses, Send some men to explore the land of Canaan, which I am giving to the Israelites. From each ancestral tribe, send out one of its leaders. Uh, so, a, uh, God's instruction a leader from each member, uh, a leader from each tribe is sent out to scout the land. And then um, in verse 3 through to 16, we see the leaders listed. Um, this is a different list to what's listed earlier, and the assumption is these are the younger leaders. Uh, who can travel throughout the land quite freely. And then in 17 to 24, Moses gives a few more specific instructions. And then we get to verse 27, and we get the report. We went into the land to which you sent us, and it does flow with milk and honey. Here is its fruit. The land is wonderful, exactly as the Lord had promised them. Fantastic. In fact, it's so abundant, they grab some grapes, two people have to carry the cluster. But, verse 28, 
the people who live there are powerful, the report comes back. And the cities are fortified and very large, and we even saw the descendants of Anak there. The land is great, but there are challenges. Large people, fortified cities need to be overcome for the people to take the land. And a murmur arises amongst the people of God. Fear and trepidation set in. And Caleb responds, having seen exactly the same things in the land, full of confidence. Verse 30. We should go up and take possession of the land, for we can certainly do it. But the others respond, verse 30, we can't attack those people. They are stronger than we are. And they spread among the Israelites a bad report about the land they have explored. They said, having said that it was good, the land we explored devours those living in it. All the people we saw there are of great size. We saw the Nephilim there. The descendants of Anak come from the Nephilim. We seemed like grasshoppers in our own eyes and we look the same to them. The people are stronger, bigger. The land is harsh. We won't survive. We can't do it, is the message that they spread. And from that, murmuring turns into despair. Chapter 14, verse 1 to 4, all the nations, repeated th three times, all the nation wails. They begin to grumble. They question God's motives. They accuse God himself of foolishness, even evil. And in the end, they reject him and instead to prefer go back into slavery than stay faithful to God. Now, Moses and Aaron knows this is terrible. And so they fall on their faces at the evil of the people. Joshua and Caleb, though, they try and turn the people aside. Um, chapter 14, verse 9, they say, do not be afraid of the people of the land because we will devour them. Their protection is gone but, and the Lord is with us. Do not be afraid of them. You see, here we have two competing responses to the one report. They've both seen the same things. Yes, the land is beautiful. Yes, the people are large. Yes, the cities are fortified. Except one is unbelief, despair, rejection. And the other, confidence. Why? I think this is the first thing that we need to see from our text of what it would look like, what we need to know in order to stay faithful. When we face difficulty, opposition and challenges, we need to remember God's power and God's promises. That's why Caleb and Joshua respond with confidence in the face of difficulty. Now, we too need to have the same view. We will face difficult things in our life. I think this is especially true when it comes to us sharing our faith with others especially in our country now. Now, the, the author Stephen McAlpine, um, a Christian, a social commentator, uh, he's explained Australia like this. Increasingly, Christianity is viewed as the bad guy. Christianity is no longer an option, it's a problem. The cultural, political and legal guns that Christianity once held are now trained on us. And you know what? That means it's hard now to talk to others about your faith. It's hard to talk to others about Jesus. It's hard to share your faith. It's hard to stand up for what you believe in the Bible. And it's hard to reach out to others. Now, I don't know about you, but that plays on my mind. Does it play on your mind? Because we've been given a charge as Jesus followers. Go and make disciples of all nations. And that's not an optional extra. If we get time, it's the heart of what we do as Jesus followers. And what Jesus has said, and what Stephen McAlpine is pointing out, is that is going to be hard in our world. So how do we face such difficulty? We remember God's promises and his power. And I think that's the only thing that's going to keep us going in the face of that kind of difficulty. Now, I think um, I was reading this week um, the, the book Honest Evangelism by Rico Tice. Uh, he's a famous English evangelist. And when he first started following Jesus, um, he was so enthralled, so full of thankfulness and joy about what Jesus had done for him, he couldn't keep it inside and he had to tell his friends in school. But what happened was they bullied him mercilessly. But he kept going. 
And years later on, one of his friends from school reflected on seeing this happen to Rico, um, and this is what he said. What really stuck with me was how Rico carried himself during such a difficult time for him. The easy option would have been to turn back and keep quiet, but Rico stuck to his faith and kept talking about his faith. Although I didn't realise it at the time, Rico's conversion and resolute faith sowed the first seed in my mind. Who was it that gave Rico the strength to continue down such a difficult path? He surely could not have done it on his own. And you know what? He didn't. He knew God's power and his promises. He knew the one who'd laid his life down for him, the one who defeated the power of death by being raised from the dead, the one who created our world, who cast the stars into the sky and by his power, power fashioned the beautiful world in which we now live. He knew the one who loved him, who wouldn't leave him, who committed himself to us and has promised to bring us safely home no matter what opposition is arrayed against us. Yes, it will be difficult to share our faith in our world. But we will be able to keep going when it's difficult if we remember God's power and his promises. That will help us remain faithful when things are difficult. Now, that's, that's the first thing from our passage. Now, what's the second thing uh, that we need in order to stay faithful in the face of difficulty? Well, let's keep looking. Now, what's happened? The people have rejected God. Effectively, what they've said to him is, we don't trust you. We don't believe you, we don't love you, and we want nothing more to do with you. You are nothing to us now. And in the midst of this, God appears. Verse 10, have a look. Then the glory of the Lord appeared at the tent of meeting to all the Israelites. The Lord said to Moses, how long will these people treat me with contempt? How long will they refuse to believe in me in spite of all the signs that I've performed among them? I will strike them down with a plague and destroy them, but I will make you into a nation greater and stronger than they. You see, God's anger burns against his people, and rightly so. If we're honest, he's right, isn't he? God's loved them. He's made them his people. He's provided for them. He's prospered them. He's saved them. He's grown them. He's fed them throughout the wilderness. He's guided them now to give them a land which is exceedingly good, as they've seen. He's even given them life itself. And and now the people dare to accuse him of not caring for them, of not loving them, of being evil. Come on, God, zap these guys. Be done with it. They, They are frustrating and useless, aren't they? How ungrateful, how arrogant, how deluded can they be? God's sentence is right, isn't it? Moses, though, intercedes for the people. He asks God to forgive them, not because they are worthy, because they clearly are not, but because of God's glory and because of his character. Pick it up there in verse 17. Moses says this, Now may the Lord's strength be displayed. You see, Moses is concerned for the Lord being gloried in this. Now may the Lord's strength be displayed just as you have declared. And he quotes God. The Lord is slow to anger, abounding in love and forgiving sin and rebellion. Yet he does not leave the guilty unpunished. He punishes the children for the sin of the parents to the third and fourth generation. In accordance with your great love, Moses asks, forgive the sins of these your people, just as if you pardoned them from the time they left Egypt until now. And then amazingly, the Lord shows mercy. He doesn't wipe them out as they deserve. You see, God has every right to wipe these people off the face of the earth. The insult, rejection, thanklessness, petulance and arrogance they've shown him should have led to their destruction. And yet against all of that, God is merciful. And this is the second thing that we need to remember if we're going to stay faithful in times of difficulty. God's people are only his people because of his grace. And if we can recognise that, if we can understand that, if we can remember that, 
It will give us confidence and humility. Now, I think this is very important. If you're here this morning, um, you don't know Jesus, you're not a follower of his, the people of God are not good people. They aren't lovable people. They aren't any better than anyone else. They're God's people because his free gift of forgiveness, because of his grace. And that will give them a confidence, knowing that it doesn't depend on them that they're right with God. It's because of his love. Their future doesn't depend on them. Now, um, many years ago, Billy Graham came to Australia. He came to Australia a couple of times. But one time when he came to Australia, he was interviewed um, by the late Mike Willisey. Now, Mike was trying to understand the faith that Billy Graham had. And he asked him this question directly. He said, do you think you will go to heaven? Billy Graham responded, absolutely. And Mike Willisey, you should see his face in this interview, he nearly falls off his chair. He can't believe the arrogance of Billy Graham to have such confidence. But he's misunderstood. Billy Graham doesn't have confidence because Billy Graham is good. Billy Graham has confidence because God is good. He has confidence because Jesus loves him, because Jesus has rescued him, because Jesus has laid down his life to wash away his sin. That's the only reason that he can say with confidence, yes, I will go to heaven, because it doesn't depend on him. That was the only ground that he had to stand on. And that ground is unshaking. It's sure, it's secure, it's certain, even when things are difficult. That's the ground upon which we can stand. Now, if we are here and we are a follower of Jesus, then this truth keeps you humble, doesn't it? You're no more worthy of God's love than anyone else, and yet he's forgiven you. He's called you to be one of his children. And he's made you safe and secure in him. And you know what? If he can do that for you, he can do that for anyone. And so that's the second thing I think we need to, we need to know and remember if we're to stay faithful when things get difficult. We need to recognise that we are only God's people by his grace, mercy and forgiveness. Now, what does it look like to remain faithful? I think this is our final thing that we need to think about. And unfortunately, the people of Israel give us a negative example. You see, the people hear the message of judgment of God, yes, and almost unbelievably, they won't be wiped out. Yes, there'll still be consequences for their actions. They'll die in the wilderness before the next generation go to take the land. But having heard this news... The people mourn, but then what do they do? Verse 39, have a look there in chapter 14. When Moses reported this to all the Israelites, they mourned bitterly. Early the next morning, they set out for the highest point in the hill country, saying, now we're ready to go up into the land the Lord promised. Surely we've sinned. You see, they revert to their same pattern, don't they? unbelief and rejection of God. Moses pleads with them, do not disobey the Lord. That's verse 41 to 43. But they don't listen. And in verse 44 and 45, they are heavily defeated and driven out of the land. Notice also at the end there, um, they just pay lip service to God's judgment while completely rejecting his word. Oh, surely we've sinned. That doesn't, even, that doesn't even skim the surface of what you've done. What they've done is the opposite of faithfulness. Because faithfulness is listening to God's word and putting it into practice. The people have heard it. They know it. They understand it. But they reject it. Faithfulness is acting in line with God's word. And so we need to hear it. Take it on and then live by it, not merely knowing about his word, but putting it into practice. But we're experts at dodging it, aren't we? And an old Christian writer, he, he summed up our hearts in, in this way. The Bible is very easy to understand, but we Christians are a bunch of scheming swindlers. 
We pretend to be unable to understand it because we know very well that the minute we understand, we are obliged to act accordingly. Our problem isn't understanding. It's putting it into practice, isn't it? What we do with God's word is what we do with him. If we reject, readjust and rewrite his word based on what we want it to say, then we show contempt for God just as the Israelites did. But if we listen to it, take it on, let it change our lives, then we show our love for him. You know, in every generation there are attempts to readjust, dampen, reject or even rewrite God's word. But our question is, will we listen to him? Will we live it out? Will you let your whole life, not just some of your life, be transformed by his word? Will you put into practice the things that are even inconvenient for you to do so? Because God's given us his word because he loves us. So that we might flourish in his world. Because living his way is the best thing for us now and always. And he gives us his word so that we might know him. His grace, his mercy, his kindness, and that it would transform our heart. So don't disregard the word of the one who loves you. Read it. Wrestle with it. Take it into your heart. Listen to it. Accept it and let it change you. That's faithfulness. That's what it looks like. Following Jesus is difficult, yes. Jesus tells us that. And so what do we do do when things get tough? Are we going to give up? Or are we going to cling to God's power and promises? Are we going to recognise that the only reason that we're his people is because of his grace? And then are we going to go and listen to his word and put it into practice? Because God didn't give up on us. Even when we hated him, rejected him, disregarded him and opposed him. In Jesus, we have one who's shown us what faithfulness really is, haven't we? Even in the face of his own death, rejection by his own people, abandoned by his friends, he stayed true. And in doing so, won forgiveness for us, even though we don't deserve it. And then remarkably, he's given us the same spirit that was in him that as we face the trials of this world, we're not alone. But he empowers us to remember his power, his promises, and to cling to his grace. And I want us to be a church that so holds so tightly to Christ that we're only able to stand by his strength and that we do that even when things are difficult. And as we do that, then people would see and would ask, who is it that gives them the strength to stay on such a difficult path? Surely they can't do it on their own. And we can't. Let me pray. Gracious Lord, thank you for your grace and mercy that you've shown us in the Lord Jesus. Thank you that while we were still far from you, you sent him to die for us that we might be brought into relationship with you. Please impress the depths and wonder of your grace on our hearts that we might be ever thankful and that we might remember your power, your promises and that grace as things get difficult so that we might cling to you We might stay faithful, listening to your word, putting it into practice. And you might strengthen us to do that so that you might get the glory and the praise. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I hope that was helpful for you. Uh, Here at St Peter's, we consider ourselves to be God's dearly loved children. We're passionate for Him and we desire for everyone to know Jesus and to grow in Him. 
And we have so many activities around that for toddlers, children, youth, uh, young adults, adults and more. Feel free to drop in any time at one of our gatherings at 8 a.m. is kind of more traditional service. 10 a.m. or 4 p.m. we have children's programs or 6 p.m. Uh, in the evening that's followed by dinner. You'd be more than welcome. If you'd like to know more about Jesus, we'd love to help you. We do a series called Hope and you can meet new people. Or if you'd like to join St. Peter's, uh, we have a special series called Belong, which can help you find your feet. So let us know. You can text us on 0466 200 791. I'll repeat that for our radio listeners, 0466 200 791. Or you can use the QR code, which we'll leave up for the next minute or so. Enjoy your week.